Sirianni today. He said that Jalen Hurts is the most coachable player, not the most coachable quarterback, the most coachable player he's ever been around. And he's obviously been in the league now for, you know, 10 plus years, been around the Phillip Rivers, been around a lot of really good players. Look at the guys on the Eagles. And I think it shows you, man, when you are willing to be to be pushed, I think it's whatever we do. Because I think it's easy. You, you can sell cars. You can be a doctor. You can be a podcast host. Think you know it all. Now, depending on who, it's easy when you're Jalen Hurts and you're listening to Nick Sirianni or you're listening to Lincoln Riley or you're listening to Nick Saban. Like, they have a lot of credibility. Not everyone talking to whoever's listening to this right now, trying to give them advice, always has credibility. But I think sometimes, like, you can get realistic, good advice and just kind of not listen. And it's a quality a lot of us probably battle, right, of being like, you know, there's a difference between criticism and like, yeah, I should probably implement that into my daily life. Like, that's pretty good advice. And uh, Jalen Hurts, he shouldn't be as good as he is. He shouldn't have become a max quarterback in the NFL. But when you have his work ethic, his desire, his drive, and his willingness to be coached, you usually get the most out of yourself. I saw with the Golden State Warriors, their star players, Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Draymond Green. Steve Kerr has pushed them and pushed them and pushed them for a decade now. And they've accomplished a lot. Now, obviously, they have, the three of them combined have a lot of talent, but they were willing to be coached. Greg Popovich talked that forever with Tim Duncan. Same thing with Belichick and Tom Brady. Every story that ever came out of New England is like, I had no choice but to take it because you go into one of these meetings and the first guy getting lit up is Tom. And that sets the tone for the whole organization. When the guy making more money than literally everyone on the team, I mean, you could take probably 30 of the lowest paid Eagles and they wouldn't even equal Jalen Hurts, right? And there's only 53 guys on the team and he's willing to be pushed. He's willing to be yelled at. We talk so much in Philly about, you know, Jason Kelsey, about Fletcher Cox, about all those guys who are just fantastic leaders. Lane Johnson, who clearly just will play under any circumstances, put his body in the line. When the highest paid guy, when the highest paid guy on the team by a wide margin is getting screamed at, is getting pushed, is listening, and is asking for it back, that's all you want, man. It's why when you look around the NFL, you know, you can't do it by yourself. Patrick Mahomes get coached hard by Andy Reid. Really hard. I mean, Andy doesn't coach like, you know, Nick Saban does, swearing at you, but he but he pushes him. Like, he's on him, right? He, cause, and Patrick wants it. And Patrick's on them. And, and it just, that gets the most out of yourself. Like, part of the, like, Michael Jordan. You watch that documentary? Like, Phil Jackson was pushing buttons there. Especially when Phil first came in. Right? Phil wasn't just like, Michael, do whatever the hell you want. It's not the way it works. Not the way it works in sports, man. I saw this good Instagram the other day of Jay-Z talking about, you know, early on in his business career, he wanted to own everything 100%. Like, I, I'm Jay-Z, I want to own 100%. And they started doing deals. Someone talked to him like, you know, you're stronger when you do partnerships with other people and you take their expertise and you use them go to higher places. He's like, you know, I started doing some of these 50-50 deals with some of these companies and we start doubling, tripling the value of the things I was involved in. And the sooner you get open-minded, like, and listen, I can battle with this sometimes. Like I can just do it all myself. No, you can't. And why would you want to? You're so much more powerful. And I can speak for myself on this podcast right here. This podcast, I'd say 90% of you never would even know who I was if it wasn't for Colin Coward and the volume. It, you would have no clue who I was. You've never heard of me. I could just be talking into a mic in front of, you know, 5,000 people. Instead, we're doing pretty well. So the notion that the top players in the league all want to be pushed, it's kind of a tried and true formula. You know, the league is full of high-level guys that are getting coached hard. And when you look at the top teams, like how did Josh Allen become a star? Brian Dable was in his ass every single day. And what happened when Brian Dable left? It was like, yes, Ken Dorsey coached him as hard. Kind of had a down year for his standards, right? Part of being a star, if you want to go to war with Patrick Mahomes, or Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow's clearly willing to be coached. <clears throat> and I think we can question, like, how great is his coach? I don't know. Time will tell. But I, I got a lot of respect for Jalen Hurts, man. And this is why I think in the NFL sometimes, and, and in drafts in general, when you try to evaluate guys and don't know the character stuff, good or bad, it, it's truly hard to put a stamp on a guy. 
it's why in the scouting community, you can be so confident when talking about a player because you know so much about the human. You have spent so much time getting to know the guy because ultimately the guy is going to be the reason the guy maximizes his talent. Now, Josh Allen has more talent in his body than than Jared Goff. But I'd say both of them are getting the max out. Why? Because they give you everything they got. They want to be pushed. They're open to listening, right? And, and clearly Jalen, like that's, I don't think he's just blowing smoke up Jalen's, you know, ass by saying that. I, I think he truly believes it because he lives it. Uh, last but not least, there's so much going on with this live PGA Tour golf thing. And the golf is completely different than football. It's a niche sport. It does it's doesn't even remotely have the audience of football, let alone like baseball or basketball. It's not nearly as big of a business as team sports. EPL, you go around the major, it's it's in a different world. It is ripe to be disrupted because in a niche sport that is a billion dollar business, but it's quickly fragmented because it's very dependent on a small number of players. It's very dependent on a certain number of sponsors. It's complicated, right? It's why Liv was able to come in. Liv was funded by the Saudis, but to just create some chaos. And I, you know, I'm not a big soccer guy. I'm sure many people listening that like, you know, European soccer. I'm pretty sure that don't the Saudis own Man City? Didn't when they bought Man City, it was not in a great position. Having a lot of teams that they've invested in over in the European soccer leagues uh, was because they were kind of down and out and they were ripe to take advantage of. They have so much money that when you are a little des- desperate, they can come in like a great white shark, right? It's why actually I think if they were smart, they would kind of sniff around Major League Baseball. Uh, the NBA, you see some of these people buying into the NBA. Their, their wealth is so big that they don't really need anybody. It's weird. Like the NBA is not as strong as it probably has been at certain points in time in, in its you know post-Michael Jordan era, but it's still strong enough where some of the richest people in this country are willing to pay an ungodly amount of money to own these teams and don't care whether they are making NFL money or not. Now, when it comes to the NFL, one thing that is going to be fascinating with Liv and the PIF and the Saudis and the PGA Tour is, is, is it anti-competitive? Because once they control all of golf, it's impossible to start another league. You get destroyed. It's very anti-competitive, right? Well, do you ever turn on TV and see like the USFL or the XFL? Like there are other professional leagues. Now, I'm pretty sure the NFL is kind of financially invested in some. But regardless, like you can start another football league. You could start another little independent baseball league. You're not going to make any money and you're going to fail, but it's not necessarily anti-competitive. The one thing the NFL really has, and I was thinking about it today. I love golf. And I like golf from, like, I love this story because a lot of you that aren't big golf fans care about it because it is fascinating. My mom called. My girlfriend's mom called. It's a it's a story on Fox News, CNN, let alone all the sports channels, right? It's They broke the news on CNBC. They didn't break the news on the golf channel. It, it's, a, it's a story that everyone's going to have an opinion on. One thing football really has going for it, one, is it it's the biggest cash cow in America when it comes to sports. And two, all their stories, or at least a lot of their stories, get that immediately. Right? You could just ask someone like, how about the Raiders in Vegas? And you could just have a start having a conversation like, who would have thought there'd be an NFL team in Vegas? And just start talking about relocation. Like, could the NFL go to London? And you could just have a realistic conversation with someone at a bar who might not even be a football fan. It's like, how, why do we have two teams in L.A.? We're just talking like locations, let alone Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers. And if you just bring up Aaron Rodgers, do you know what could come up? Not like Aaron Rodgers. How about his back-to-back MVPs? Like That might be a conversation. Or how the Packers going to be without him. Or immediately comes up like, God, how about the vaccine stuff? Or Jesus, sat in a dark room, right? Or damn, was he really going to retire? Like the elements of the drama, and this is why football is the number one television show In America, it has every fucking element that you want. It's got all the casual drama, the big money, the succession type stuff, the sales of the teams, the moving of the teams. So then to the niche, like how teams are playing certain defenses, (laughs) right? How this player, I saw some quotes today from uh, coming out of Seattle. Uh, 
Tyler Lockett says that Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be a phenomenal player. DK just went on like a two paragraph rant about how good the guy is. So it has like really in depth stuff on certain players, on certain schemes, on certain coaches. It just kind of got it all. I, mean, I saw today a clip from my guy Field Yates, Andy Reid, just talking about the different food items at the White House when they went. He actually gave this pretty good description of French toast, grilled cheese, ham sandwich that he said had some powdered sugar on the top. It sounds like it shouldn't work, but when you really think about it, I could see it kind of working. Uh, I, I think the NFL, and I've said this forever, it's not going to stay on top our entire lives. That's just not the way the world works. Things ebb and they flow. But for the foreseeable future, when it comes to financially, they're pretty insulated. They really are. Because of the television money, because of the owner wealth that's been created this last decade plus, uh, and from the club that they don't really need anybody else. They they really don't. And the reason golf was ripe to be taken advantage of is because they kind of needed some help. They got out in front of their skis. They were never going to be able to compete with the Saudis making these crazy elevated events. There's not the support. There's not enough people watching. There's The sponsors can't double their investments. It does not pencil. But it has to pencil because there's no way for them to keep their top stars if they can't pay them what the Saudis can pay. Right. Eventually the dam opens back up. Right. Like why do why do they own some of these soccer teams? Because they're fucking going broke. Like if you told me the Oakland A's were sold to someone with the Saudis and they moved into Vegas, like, ah, I could I could see that. Yeah, who would want that business? Pretty risky. Not a guaranteed moneymaker. Maybe they wouldn't care. They just want to get their hands dirty. The NBA, probably closer to the NFL in terms of there's enough super rich people lined up that they can insulate their business. Uh you know, well enough. Now, how, for the foreseeable future, who knows? You, you never know. I think I saw a quote from Adam Silver that said, you know, I think he pushed back on the notion, because clearly a lot of people are asking, like, are they going to get involved in some of the major team sports? And I think it's inevitable they're going to try. They're just slowly, surely wake, moving their way in. Uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye on.